I'm with Radshree of Intel. My voice is ruined, as you can hear. Radshree, your name and your title with Intel, please. Uh, uh, absolutely. Hi, my name is Rashri Chabuswar. I am with Intel Client Computing Group. I'm an Intel Fellow working on um, hardware software co-design and uh, developing technologies, helping develop technologies like Thread Director. And we're recording this at the end of August in Malaysia, uh, under India, for a few weeks until the big Meteor Lake announcements. 3D performance hybrid architecture was my main note to myself. Sure. So uh, the reason why we call it 3D hybrid architecture with Meteor Lake is because, as you saw, we have uh, three hierarchies of cores. The compute tile has P and E cores, and there are low power E cores on the SOC tile. All of them, even though microarchitecture is the same, uh, the design considerations and the design objectives of these two different E cores are uh, completely different, right? So, so just to cut in briefly, because this is the new part, so where Alder Lake and Raptor Lake introduced the hybrid architecture and we had E-cores and P-cores, we now have another pair of ultra-low E-cores. So instead of having distribution between two types of core, we've got three, three, three hierarchies of core. Uh, but even the, the, core but the two low power, low power and ultra-low power mm -hmm. are the same architecture. So you've got a whole bag of tricks to play with. Absolutely, and uh, that's why we call it 3D uh, mm. architecture, right? Because we get uh, different dimensions to mm. meet power objectives and performance objectives as well. And you referred to Thread Director as a hinting system. So, how does Thread Director interact with the OS and the applications? Thread Director is a mechanism that sits in hardware, right? Uh, it's part of our hardware offering. And uh, what it is, is um, there are two portions of it. One is the classification, instruction classification portion, which basically says that what work is executing on cores, and when that work is executing, what type of work is it, right? And we put it in four categories, class zero, one, two, and three. And this is based on, uh, as an example, class zero is a scalar type of instruction where we have same, um, performance, uh, relative performance, which is IPC, instructions per cycle between P and E cores. And then we have um, diff other classes where P cores are more performant and we indicate that to the operating system. The second part of it is a table that sits in memory space. When the system is booted as a hybrid system, um, you know, uh, like a 3D hybrid mm -hmm. system or even older uh, generations that we have, operating system initializes that space in memory and then hardware fills information in there. And it says that if you are running class zero type of work, here is a most performant core to run on and here is a most efficient core to run on. So hardware populates all the information that OS can use and then OS reads that information and combines it with its own goodness, right? So OS knows priority, it knows quality of service, it knows foreground, background, whether the system is running on AC or DC, different power plans, etc and then it decides to act on that information based on what we provide to them, right? It combines that all of so that. So the, the decision comes down to the OS. The decision Thread comes Director down to the... Thread Director is just giving it some help. Uh, Thread Director gives it help from the stats that are visible to hardware only, that mm -hmm. OS otherwise would not have any access to. So Thread Director augments information uh, to make it uh, more intelligent from OS's perspective. And how rapidly can the OS move tasks around the course? That's an excellent question. So one thing we worked with uh, ROS vendors early on also is even though this information is available um, at a very uh, low granularity, uh, OS consumes it based on when it thinks it's appropriate to do that, right? Okay. So for example, um, when a thread context switch happens, it can decide at that time that, hey, I want to consume this information because I'm anyway moving thread from one core to mm. another, right? But um, it's not something that we provide a hint and OS stops everything that it's doing and it moves the thread because there are trade-offs with that, mm. right? If you move threads too much around different cores and as with any other context switch, there is a penalty associated with it. So we don't want to do it too frequently. Okay. Right. So operating system chooses the cadence. We provide the information to them. Operating system chooses the cadence based on uh, the um, uh, you know quantum end or uh, next uh, uh, context switch, and then uh, they use this uh, extra information that we provide. And when you're referring to a cadence and quickly or too quickly, are you talking in terms of milliseconds, seconds, or tens of seconds? Uh, yeah. This is this is in terms of milliseconds okay. uh, because. Uh, Seconds is still forever in terms of yeah. 
systems, right, and uh, right. execution and uh, architecture. So definitely in milliseconds, but we don't want to do it too frequently. Like every millisecond, we don't want to move some things, right? So it de really depends on the thread run time and uh, when the quantum end happens, etc. So that's where OS consumes that information. And as you're working with Thread Director and you're addressing CPU cores, mm -hmm. Do you personally care one way or the other whether you have SMT or hyperthreading on a particular core? Does it just not matter to you? So uh, that's a great question. And uh, if you look at the reason why we kind of introduced hybrid was in terms of multi-threaded scalability, mm. right, to get the performance. But there are lots of tasks or uh, applications that are out there which are limited threaded. Mm. And if you look at um, uh, the benefit that they get, because our e-cores are not really uh, any low perf like too much low performance mm. or anything, right? They are very decent cores. They give gr good performance in themselves. So if you look at most of the applications that run out there, instead of scheduling it on the hyper-threaded sibling, uh, if you are multi uh, limited threaded application, mm. we always see that there is. Um, a uh, good benefit that we first use all the physical cores, then the e-cores, and lastly the hyper-threaded. Okay. Right? And um, uh, this hierarchy uh, and um, uh, the awareness is already part of uh, Windows 11 that was introduced with Alder Lake. Yes. Right? So uh, we do use hyper-threaded core, but to maximize the benefit, we use it last because you are going to get more out of using the um, E cores than what you are going to get out of using hyperthreaded cores. Okay, one of my notes to myself when you were talking earlier, I was wondering if in generations to come, for example, a processor has 96 E cores, for example, would there be a stage potentially where you go, great, one task per core, done, or is it never as straightforward as that? Um, so uh, there is a, uh, I mean, with Alder Lake, uh, we had introduced that, right? There's a kind of the reason why we had eCore is they are area efficient mm. and you get uh, quite a bit of um, multi-threaded throughput uh, in place of having one P core and fitting four E cores there, mm. uh, etc. Right? That's a rough trade-off that we had and you get good performance benefits. So for multi-threaded tasks uh, such as uh, rendering and other things that go on in creator segment, absolutely. If we have threads that can take benefit of that many number of E cores, um, they will scale to that. Uh, right, uh, there is no limitation from operating system or anything perspective. I mean, we have that in RZ on product okay. line, anyways. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, that's kind of whole design of scalability from our side. One of the notes I made to myself, and I may misunderstood what you said earlier. It suggested that because here we're talking about mobile rather than desktop, that my own note says the power budget might make an E core better choice than a throttled P core. You know, as if the P core hasn't got as much power as like, so how does that work? Yeah, so uh, that's an excellent question. And what happens is within our SOC, the entire chip that we have, right, we have one power limit uh, that is set, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then our internal algorithms figure out that, hey, NPU is active or GPU is active and they need something. NPU being the AI tile. Yes. Within the processor. The internal power management algorithm do that division. Okay. Now, uh, what happens is um, uh, within that division, we may uh, see that because, you know, we have to deliver on graphics and AI and other things, you get sometimes lesser power budget to CPUs, right? And it's not necessarily a bad thing because, uh, you know, we do need something to deliver on the AI or GPU performance that we want to get, right, for our customers' mm -hmm. uh, demands and needs. So if that power budget is low, there is a crossover point, right? We have a uh, voltage and frequency curve that we get, we call it VF curve, and there is a crossover point. And what that, what that means is if we go lower on the voltage side that is available to P-Core, just to keep the P-Core up and running and to get to um, uh, nominal frequency, uh, we may need higher voltage, but at the same time, E core being relatively smaller, they can actually run at higher frequency at the same voltage. So that's where the uh, kind of um, uh, data point comes in that you may see certain cases, certain class of instructions that may be better uh, suited to run on E core uh, under given power thermal constraints. And Thread Director will give that feedback to operating system because um, this is already accounted for in the Thread Director logic. So, so Thread Director is not just looking at each processor, uh, each um, core, 
as one, two, three, four, five, six. It's also how it's functioning depending on the resources as available and the exactly, parameters. Exactly, the so. power budget and the thermal consideration and everything that is available to the core complex. It looks at all of that. Okay, yeah. so, we, so is thread director in potentially then part of the cooling strategy of the laptop? As in, if the thing's pounding away and hammering up to the thermal limit, you could actually back off potentially to e-cores and help the overall system. So, um, it doesn't know about fan uh, okay. and things, uh, right? Because if you look at it like fan management technology, a lot of OEM consider that they, as their proprietary okay. thing, right? They have their own fan controls and uh, all of that. But where it helps, uh, indirectly at least, is because it provides information and these are efficient cores to run on, mm -hmm. OEMs can set up a hetero scheduling policy, which means start with the efficient cores first. And um, uh, OS will honor that because OEM set it up. And it, it will say that, hey, if my work can stay on efficient core, I'll stay on efficient cores, right? Okay. So it helps indirectly in there, but we don't have fan information available. Okay. Us. And Thread Director is a piece of hardware within the processor. How do you update your policies? You, you presume you update them once in a while. Is that part of the management engine, for example? The, I presume there are updates that you can push out. Yeah. So. Um, when we say hardware, it's also the kind of firmware logic mm. uh, software piece that runs in our hardware, uh, right? Uh, so it's not really a software that's like operating system, but the inbuilt software, you know, firmware by, uh, kind of part of the P code uh, that we do, right? Uh, the uh, PCU, uh, the so power is, control. Is that unit. part of the BIOS update, or is that part of a driver update? It, for example, it will I mean. be. It will be included in the BIOS update. Okay. Uh, it, there is no separate driver for Thread Director. Right. And um, uh, the way uh, kind of it works is, uh, let's say we found some um, different way of classifying a specific instruction, we might have updates to that, or um, uh, there were uh, 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 shifts in, you know, different, if different IP took power budget and mm -hmm. how we want to model it, there might be updates to that. We don't do updates as in, like every month there won't be any updates to it because the infrastructure is pretty solid but as we have you know more designs coming mm. out like uh, for example for SKUs right different SKUs yep. we have uh, our P stack U stack we will have updates between those uh, going on and is the thread director in Alder Lake Rapt Lake and now Meteor Lake is that the same thing just doing different stuff or is it, has it changed? Uh, so it has evolved. Uh, the hardware is the same, mm. right? The logic is the same, how we expose information to operating system. Alder Lake and Raptor Lake did not have the low power e-course, mm, right? Sure. So we have that. So uh, an internal power management decisions have changed as a result of having low power e-course. The logic on how and what information it provides uh, has changed, but the infrastructure stays the same. Presumably Thread Director carries an overhead because it's a workload. Could Microsoft change Windows sufficiently such that the Thread Director became unnecessary? Um, there is no overhead in terms of, because see all of this classification and everything that happens in hardware, right? Mm. Hardware has this information already. Core has this performance monitoring unit events and everything. So if it happened in software, I would say that there is overhead associated with it. But since it's happening in hardware and the information is already available, there is no overhead particularly associated with it. In fact, I think from OS vendors perspective, mm -hmm. it makes their job easier because they don't have to track all these different performance mm. monitoring unit event, figure out am I cash bound, what instruction am I running, what are the power thermal budget. We encapsulate it in one thing and give it to them. So right? the, the polite answer is basically you know your products better than they do. And uh, depending on the power thermal consideration, mm. things change, which sure. they don't have a way to react to it, right? So that, that's why it makes sense to put it in hardware and give it as a hint interface to them okay. so that they can consume the information as they like. Can you imagine a scenario where a software writer would actually think it's advantageous to that company to write inferior code such that Thread Director says, no, this needs a P-Core. So they actually essentially managed to escalate themselves from E-Cores to P-Cores. Or is that just garbage? So uh, from software developer's perspective, uh, Thread Director is kind of hidden as part of the OS itself, mm. right? The, the decision. But, so they, but they understand how they, it works. They functions. understand how yeah. that works. So now where it might not play to their advantage is, is if they did like this one-to-one -one affinity, right? Mm. They said, oh, I have 10 threads. Why don't I do this? Thread one runs on core one, thread two runs mm. on core two. Then, and let's say, 
NPU started, right? Mm. Because some other tasks started on the system, our power budget reduced and they may have said that, oh, I'm always going to run on P cores and now P cores are not performant mm -hmm. anymore. So they may actually lose performance in that, right? Okay. So um, uh, f for that reason, having OS and hardware figure out on what's the best uh, combination is in their best interest. Okay. Yeah. I'm not suggesting software yeah. vendors would ever <laughs> consider <laughs> such a thing. Well, I mean, uh, honestly, like we are seeing the use of affinities going down quite a bit, right? Because people understand that right. modern hardware kind of takes care of it. You presumably have different policies for mobile and for desktop because for desktop you've essentially got infinite power mm -hmm. and probably better cooling, whereas for mobile, battery sure. and limitations. on Is it as simple as saying different policies, therefore you push out different code but, and you're just reordering the priorities or is that... Is it far more complicated? Oh, it's that? already done. Uh, yeah. So from our perspective, as I was saying, right, uh, for every core, we expose two type of information to OS. One is what is the most performant core and what is the most efficient core. Because in hardware, while at runtime, we don't know whether somebody is going to run this piece of software on desktop or mobile or AC or wall powered. We don't know that, right? Okay. So we provide all the information to OS. Now OS and OEMs, uh, and OEMs have uh, control over this via the processor power management um, settings that Microsoft exposes them, the infrastructure, that they can say that, hey, I want to use um, hetero scheduling policy, which means that start from the most efficient core and then expand out. Or I want to use standard scheduling policy, which means start from the performance core and then uh, go down the stack. So uh, because they have this knob, an operating system via thread director knows which is performant core and which is efficient core, all the infrastructure is available to them. So if OEM says that I want to use hetero, then they'll start from the uh, e-cores and expand out. If they say I want standard, they'll start from P core and expand it out. We don't need to make any changes to any information we publish. This is all available to operating system already. And as I recall, back when Alder Lake was launched, there was a bit of a debate because that was when Windows 11 was just coming out. Mm -hmm. It's been updated a huge number of times since then. So we're going back a little while now. But th at the time, there was a lively debate. Should people stick with Windows 10 or should they move to Windows 11? Right. Is it now as simple as saying, yes, Windows 11? Absolutely. Just as straightforward as that? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's the ideal point yeah. to finish on. <laughs> Thank you very that's much, Raj. Thank you, yeah. It's been a heck of a busy day. We're off to see some more good stuff tomorrow with Intel, uh, which will be covered in separate videos. Great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.